Good evening. I am, for, <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, I am Anna de Konink. I'm the executive director here at the Koch Institute. And um, I want to say welcome, everyone. It is uh, really an honor and a privilege to be here on what is pretty much my favorite day and evening of the year. Um, they, I, I, I just really appreciate you all being here to um, celebrate science, research, knowledge, truth, um, collaboration, progress, and of course, our 2018 Koch Institute Image Awards winners. So congratulations, you will. <laughs> you will have more opportunities to clap later this evening. Um, so I probably say this every year, <laughs> and I'm sorry, but I really think this year's collection might be the best one yet. Um, and I say collection so nobody feels, you know, slighted, but um, it's really a remarkable testament to um, what's going on here in the building and at MIT and also Erica Reinfeld's talents in getting these images displayed in such a wonderful, amazing, exquisite fashion. Um, there are many people to thank. Firstly, um, I am quickly um, going to um, forward these slides and say thank you to our judges. I would love for you all to stand up, those who were able to come. I know Michael Heeman just left because he has some grading to do. Uh, but everyone else, if you would please stand. I know there is at least two others here. They seem to be shy or they're still drinking at the bar. Hmm. Dan? Oh, there, ah, see, they were very reluctant. <laughs> Thank you. As you can see, we had about 10 judges this year, and uh, they together really uh, were able to convene and converge on these 10 wonderful images, and I really appreciate their time and insights and um, advice. I uh, also want to thank our sponsors for this event. Um, Nikon Instruments in Zeiss um, and some other uh, people who have made this event and these images in the gallery possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I, um, I, of course, want to thank this year's winners for participating in this wonderful uh, initiative that we have here. I think it's a wonderful way to highlight the research that goes on at MIT and to bring it to the public eye and to celebrate in the wonderful progress and uh, knowledge that scientific research can bring. And then um, finally, the, the person that I can't really thank enough, um, one that reserves uh, thanks like none other is Erica Reinfeld, who does communications and outreach for the Koch Institute. And she is in charge of our public galleries, tonight's event and um, our image awards. She will be DMC tonight. She is a little bit of a lack of voice, so bear with her. Um, I, uh, I'm really thankful for all that you've done for this. It's quite a feat. Everyone, please. Join me. Thank you, Anna, and thanks for taking over my slides. Um, as you can tell, I'm missing a voice, but I've been chugging tea and cough drops uh, in celebration, so please do bear with me. I am also incredibly excited about these images, and it is my pleasure to introduce you, not just to the images, but to the people behind him, them who have been working incredibly hard to help us come up with ways to explain these images to anyone who comes to the galleries and visits us online. So we'll just jump right into uh, our first image. Um, and we'll say, I'll say we're going to save questions for the end. Uh, we'll have dessert out in the galleries, and that's a great time to go and find people who made the images that you're interested in and ask them more questions. Um, so the first image we have uh, is Order from Chaos. Um, one of the most beautiful things about scientific research is that almost anything is possible. So we're going to start off our presentations tonight with a glimpse into that possibility. This is an image that was created by one of the Koch Institute's extramural labs, one that spans a whole range of activities um, from the fundamental mechanisms of cell communication to applied tissue engineering. And this image in 
what really the judge has described as striking simplicity um, manages to encompass pretty much all of that. So I'm going to invite Alan up to give you some order from chaos. Thank you so much, Erica. So what I like the most about this image is that it exemplifies the concept of emergence. Now, what do I mean by emergence? Well, let's take a look at this plant. This plant is beautiful and it's complex. And however, it grows from just a seed, but that seed has a group of cells in it and they interact with each other so that as a group, they work together to become something more complex than the sum of their parts. And that's what emergence is. It's complexity arising from things interacting. Now, it doesn't just stop with this plant, because this plant interacts with a very special kind of animal, the cat. <laughs> and this cat is itself the product of emergence, because when a mommy cat and a daddy cat love each other very much, <laughs> they make kittens. And those kittens grow up into beautiful and complex cats. Now, this plant happens to be catnip. And if you plant catnip in your yard, you will quickly learn that there is yet another level of interaction that results. <laughs> so, so the, um, the, all of the interactions that give rise to this plant and this cat and the cat's love for catnip, they're all written into the genes that govern the behavior of their cells. And that brings us back to the image. You see, I work in a synthetic biology lab. And synthetic biology is all about designing genes that work together so that they can give cells new behaviors and new abilities that they didn't have before, new complex behaviors. And so if you look at these cells, they actually started out all the same as undifferentiated cells. But we put some genes into them that work together to make these cells make a choice, a decision either stay green and go down one path, or become red and go down another. And so after making this choice, green or red, they actually arrange themselves into these shapes, these structures. From something that was all the same, we get beauty and complexity. But it doesn't just stop there, because the green cells go on to become nerve cells. The red cells go on to become liver tissue. And we plan to use this liver tissue to study interactions between the liver and drugs that are being tested for the clinic. We can find out, will a drug be toxic to the liver? Will the liver break down the drug too quickly for it to be effective? And one day, we would like to be able to make liver tissue so realistic that we can put them into patients who have failing livers and rescue them. And that's the potential of synthetic biology, that by manipulating genes on the molecular level, we can improve the world at large. And it's all because of emergence. Because those systems of genes govern the behavior of cells. Those cells interlinked form tissues. Tissues interlinked form organs. Organs give life to living beings who together coexist, interlinked in our world. A world of beauty, a world of complexity, a world interlinked. Thank you. And I, I, I'd like to acknowledge my, uh, my postdoctoral advisor, Ron Weiss, members of the Weiss Lab, uh, sources of funding, the National Institutes of Health and National Science Foundation, and of course, my cats, Jack and Melvin. Thank you very much. We have something brand new this year, um, and so you actually get a trophy. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you so much. All right, guys, I don't want to be catty, but that's going to be a tough act to follow because it was well organized. Oh, there are going to be a lot more. Don't worry. Um, the stem cell tempo, the stempo was good. That one wasn't as good. And um, he really delivered the goods on that. So. Now that we've got this big picture uh, of how all of these things are connected, um, the, our next few presentations are gonna go back and look at some of those individual components leading up to the complexity. Um, so our first, our next, sorry, second, our next uh, image, I wanna tell you a little bit about it. 
usually about the contest. So we, us we limit the number of contributions that any individual can make to five images. Every year, somebody tries very, very hard to get around the five image limit. Um, and this year is probably the most clever workaround that I have ever seen, um, because instead of submitting five images, Lauren submitted 360. <laughs> so um, this is actually an image that took a whole weekend to prepare, and then another whole weekend to re-prepare when she realized that the proportions of bricks to mortar weren't exactly perfect. So I don't want to get political, but I got to tell you, I am really excited that she built this wall. <laughs> All right. So um, as you can see, Lauren has a great eye for detail, and she's going to walk us through some of the details of that image. So as Erica said, I am Lauren. I am a postdoc in the Amman lab. And in the Amman lab, many of us study mitosis, and specifically the causes and consequences of errors during mitosis which is shown here broken down into its stages. And mitosis is the process by which a mother cell is divided into two genetically identical daughter cells. And this process is regulated by the mitotic checkpoint shown here, um, which is a collection of proteins which function to make sure that all of the chromosomes have made attachments to the mitotic spindle before the cell proceeds into anaphase. And when you have misregulation of these proteins, such as increased levels, decreased levels, or changes in the activity of these proteins, you end up with chromosome missegregation and aneuploidy. And aneuploidy is the state of having an abnormal chromosome content. On the left here, we see a cartoon of a euploid mouse karyotype, which contains 20 sets of chromosomes. And on the right, we have example of an aneuploid karyotype, which has lost chromosomes. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe? It did. Actually, I didn't change any of it. Okay, it has lost chromosomes, such as green and red ones here, and has also gained some chromosomes as well. And what we know about aneuploidy is that really it is not good for cellular health. So primary cells in culture, when they're aneuploid, have fitness defects and they show signs of stress. And aneuploidy is not commonly seen in normal tissues, but it is a hallmark of cancer and is seen in the majority of solid tumors. And then an observation that my postdoc project is built off of is this fact that um, aneuploidy is really suspiciously absent from tissues of mouse mitotic checkpoint mutants. So these mice are engineered to missegregate chromosomes, and we would expect that the mouse itself is aneuploid. However, this is not true for all the tissues. So the hypothesis that I have is that the immune system might be involved in this process of clearing aneuploid cells. The question I have is, can the immune system find these aneuploid cells and remove them? And here we have a cartoon where all of these blocks represent cells, and the ones that are in orange are ones that I've highlighted as being aneuploid cells. And so with my hypothesis, these aneuploid cells could send out some message that the immune system recognizes and then finds these specific cells to target and remove them from the population. And as part of this project, I've taken a sort of whole mouse approach to look at tissues from throughout the body of this aneuploid mouse model and say, do we have differences in tissue architecture or the composition of different tissues? And so we have a few here, such as a whisker, eye. We have the skin cut in three different sections here, as well as muscle in two different directions. And so I really looked through almost literally every single tissue of the mouse to say what's different. Uh, so these images are ones that are done with a very common histological staining of H and E, which stains basically based on pH from acidic to basic, blue to pink. And so I look at tissue structure here. We see the small intestine and skin as two different sections. So these are what are also out on my image. But I have used the, the slides generated from this project to also do staining for different cell types, such as here in red we see T cells of the adaptive immune system and so I'm identifying their prevalence in tissues such as the small intestine, colon, and skin as well. And then this work in combination with genetic models, I'm hoping, actually we've got some really great leads so far, will um, 
uncover a role for the immune system in anti-cancer surveillance that's happening where the immune system is able to target aneuploid cells and remove them from the body before they do something like turn into a tumor, as well as identify a hurdle that aneuploid cells have to overcome if they're going to persist and really thrive in a cancer. So I'd like to thank my lab. Uh, so I said the Iman lab, specifically Angelica, who is a wonderful mentor. And uh, this fall we were the Scooby-Doo gang at the KI retreat. This is why we have this here. Uh, as well as the Swanson Biotechnology Center. And obviously my image is a whole lot of work for, of histology. So I'd really like to also thank the Hope Babette Tang Histology Facility for a lot of great work and consultation with preparation of my samples to make me have good images to be able to compile for that wall, uh, as well as the various funding and Koch Institute for the great space to work in. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So that was uh, exposed brick, probably our most scanned, dullest image of the night. Um, but I'll just say, yeah, I know, if my puns are making you cry, don't worry. We can get you a tissue. Lauren has a lot of tissues. <laughs> All right. I'm actually really glad <laughs> for the shout out uh, to the histology facility. Um, histology images do not appear very frequently. If you look back over the years, there aren't a lot of histology images in our exhibition. And I mean, I guess Lauren covered enough to uh, make up for all the past seven years. But as it turns out, the judges actually spotted another image this year, um, also taken at the histology f facility that um, really stood out to them. Um, so, and although I'm realizing actually now, since it is International Women's Day, we should maybe start calling it the Herstology facility. But um, either way, I am, I am very pleased to introduce Caitlin Sadler from the Anderson and Langer Laboratories, who's going to speak to you about another application of the Herstology experience. Histology experience. That makes it sound really exciting. Um, well, my name is Caitlin Sattler. Uh, I'm an immunologist and I work in tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. And basically what that means is I'm trying to use our body's defense system to help build new tissues and heal our wounds quicker. So just like we can train, uh, train our immune system to fight off diseases, we can also train it to uh, heal wounds quicker. So during my PhD, I was working with a material that's currently being tested in the clinic um, to help regrow muscle. And I noticed that without a certain type of immune cell, the T cell, we had a lot of fat and collagen growing in that uh, muscle tissue, which you can see the fat is those white spots in the picture on the right. So when we're rebuilding these tissues, we need techniques to figure out if we're growing the proper cells and structures in our target area. How do we know we're making muscle and not fat? And that's where histology comes in. So the stain that's in the image is known as Movet's pentachrome. Pensa meaning five means that there's five different dyes. The red is for uh, muscle and other soft tissues. We've got yellow for collagen and connective tissue, black for elastic fibers, dark purple for cell nuclei, and we also have blue for mucin and sugar-rich compounds. So how do we know our experiment worked? That's a big thing that people don't really talk about. Um, and that's where the image comes in. Um, this is the unsung hero of biomedical research. Um, this is a control image. So basically, if we have our sample and we're missing a color, how do we know that that color is not there because that structure is not there or that cell is not there, as opposed to we messed up the stain, which can happen. Um, so for that, we often pick a tissue that we know is going to express all of those different colors. So we can compare that to our sample, and if all of our colors are in our control, we know we stain things correctly. So do we really need these controls? So why do we need them? And just to look onto our bench, this is the protocol for that stain. Um, so we've got a minute here, 30 seconds there, and 30 seconds can go by real quick, especially when you're trying to set up a timer for 30 seconds. So 
an accident, you can easily double your incubation time. So you really need to have that extra piece of tissue there so you know what things are supposed to look at look like. So if I have this stain with skin, how is my skin supposed to look like? Oh, I have a piece of porcine colon, that colon tissue, which has all of those colors present. If one's missing, I know I messed it up. So beyond wound healing and tissue regeneration, we're also using this stain to help locate materials that we've implanted in the body. So here you can see a material that's been implanted and stains bright blue, which makes it really easy to find. And also the stain helps us identify the different tissues. So we can see where those different materials are and how the tissues that they're next to will change the response to that material. So maybe you know, something next to your colon will respond different than something next to your liver. So we're currently looking at that um, and expanding into the wound healing projects as well. So with that, I would like to acknowledge quite a few people. Uh, my mentors, Dr. Daniel Anderson and Dr. Robert Langer. Uh, Karina McIsaac, who's a graduate student, helped out with the staining and uh, is learning all these different procedures. Davina Fiono, who assisted with the material implantation studies. Katie Olofsson, who's helped out with material synthesis. Um, Kathy from the Hope About Tang Histology Facility, who offered this beautiful image that her niece drew of her, and she said it looks a lot more like me when I get in at 5 a.m. Um, but thanks to her for um, helpful conversations, um, just there to chat and being a generally awesome person. Um, I don't know if anyone knew that. I'm sure anyone that's been down in the facility does. Um, as well as all of the organizations on the right. So MIT, the Koch Institute, uh, Marble Center for Cancer Nanomedicine, as well as the Swanson Biotechnology Center, um, the Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital, funding from uh, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, as well as the Convergence Scholars Program and the TED Fellows Program. Thank you. <laughs> Oh. So one thing that Caitlin didn't actually tell you about her image, which was we have a line on the information form for the judges that says, tell us the most exciting thing about your image. And what Caitlin wrote in this is that it worked the first time, um, which never, ever happened. So congratulations on getting a result to die for. OK, control yourselves, people. I will. I will move it along to the next, uh, the next section. There were two in that one. All right. So this is about all kinds of imaging, not just histology. And of course, um, histology isn't the only way to tell if your experiment is working, if your technology is doing what it's supposed to do. So our next image uh, encapsulate another bioengineering project that is focused on the immune system, but for a completely different purpose. So rather than treating injury or disease, this is a project that aims to prevent it um, using nanoparticles. So, but to really appreciate what we're doing, we need to understand how vaccination works. So I'm gonna invite Jason to come on up here and give us a shot, give that a shot. Thanks, Erica. Uh, hi, my name is Jason Chang, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Dow Irvine's lab at the Koch Institute. And today I'm delighted to share with you some of the work that I've done in the past year uh, that focuses on vaccine development and drug delivery in the context of HIV. So, what are vaccines? So, uh, here you can see uh, a needle with the vaccination in here, and vaccines are generally given as a preventative measure to help prevent patients from foreign pathogens. These are typically made up of part of a virus, which we refer to as antigens. And we inject this into our body, and this normally triggers an immune response. And this occurs in secondary lymphoid tissues, such as the lymph node. Uh, here, illustrated in green. And this is throughout our body, so when we get the injection, uh, these nanoparticles travel to these sites and the immune reaction occurs there. This re immune response then leads to the development of uh, immunity and protection against these pathogens. As you guys may have gathered from the title of our image, a la node, we want to target our vaccines to the draining lymph node uh, where the immune response occurs. So how do we do this? Uh, well, uh, ah, there we go. 
So, <laughs> our lab uh, synthesizes nanoparticles to either display or encapsulate vaccines to promote more efficient drainage to the lymphatics and ideally uh, end up in the lymph node where the immune system uh, takes place. Uh, and due to the physical size of these nanoparticles, it readily drains towards the lymphatics and accumulates in the lymph node. So, let's take a closer look at a lymph node. So here you have uh, different cell types uh, highlighted here, and what we really are interested in are these follicle structures. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, I wanna focus on this structure, as this is where we want to deliver our vaccines. And in these follicles lie uh, follicular dendritic cells, which we can consider as quality control engineers, and these germinal center B cells, which are our antibody producing uh, cells. And the reason why we are interested in this is because uh, these germinal center B cells help provide the antibodies to help neutralize the foreign antigen when we're infected. So, uh, what are we looking at? So in this image, you can see we have these really beautiful structures called follicles that are just throughout our lymph node when we get immunized or vaccinated with an antigen of choice. And in blue, you see are these nanoparticles that we are interested in to get it delivered to these structures. And you can see in some of the images, you have nice co-localization, but in some parts of the lymph node, you don't get uh, such good co-localization. And unlike uh, the previous talker, our experiment didn't work the first time. So <laughs> now what do we do? Um, so if we take a closer look at the actual image, uh, this is the same uh, piece of tissue, but just enlarged. And I'd like to show you a video of this. So in purple now are the nanoparticles of interest, and in orange are the follicular dendritic cells, which are quality engineers, and in blue are the germinal center B cells, which produce the antibodies. So ideally, we want to target these nanoparticles to these structures to help elicit a better immune response. So here you can see an uh, overlaid image, and uh, you can see that some of the nanoparticles are clustered in these structures, but I think we could do better. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to conclude by saying that uh, in more experiments to come, we want to effectively deliver these nanoparticles to the lymph node to promote these germinal center reactions and lead to more effective vaccines. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, Daryl for his mentorship. Uh, special shout out to Talar, Tyson, and Chris for contributing to various parts of this project, uh, the Swanson Biotechnology Center, and uh, my funding sources. These are some really awesome nanoparticles. I, like, I feel like they're really gonna go out on a limb for me. <laughs> Sorry, that one was a tough sell, wasn't it? No damage done. We will just move right along to the next one. So our next image um, offers another view of infection, but this time from a cell biology perspective. Um, one of the things that the judges tried very, very hard to do this year was to create a balance between fundamental biology and applied technology. Um, and so, all this, although this project is about the cause of a disease that most people have heard of, uh, toxoplasmosis, it's not a story about how to fight it. In fact, it's a story about how to learn from it. And so, here to tell that story is Claire. Thank you, Erica. So yeah, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Laredo lab, and in the Laredo lab, we work on this parasite, Toxoplasma gondii. And some people call it the most successful pathogen on the planet. So it can infect every species of bird and mammal, and it's thought that about one in three human beings on the planet are infected. So look to your left, look to your right. <laughs> one of the three of you probably has Toxo. <laughs> Luckily, it is almost always completely asymptomatic. So you will never see any symptoms. However, if you become immunocompromised, for instance, through cancer treatment, or if you get an infection while you're pregnant, it can have devastating consequences, like encephalitis, blindness, and miscarriage. So how can this parasite do this? So we're very 
we're, this is the life cycle of the parasite here. And it's a single-celled organism, but to grow, to replicate, it has to invade a host cell. So it will swim along until it finds a host cell, and it will attach to the membrane, seen here, and then it will dive into the host cell, here. Once it's inside, it forms a pocket around itself, a membrane-bound pocket called a vacuole. And inside this vacuole, it will replicate. And it does this in a really unusual way called endodiogeny, where two daughters grow inside the mother and then burst out. You can see this happening here. And actually, in the image the judges selected, I caught some of these parasites in the process of replicating. And so you have many rounds of this replication, and eventually you get these beautiful flower-shaped vacuoles you can see here. I think they're beautiful anyway. Um, here you can see the nucleus of the host cell. This is a human cell. And here is a, cyto here is a skeleton of the host cell. So now we have a cell full of parasites, but the two, these parasites have to escape to go and infect new cells. And they do this by bursting open the host cell. You can see this here. They burst out um, and go and invade new cells. So I'm very interested in how the parasite can keep its structure throughout this really complex life cycle. It it's, um, has many forces on it. So I've, to do this, I study this one protein called GAPM1A, seen here in green. And this is the same protein that's in white in the image outside. And underneath here, you can see the microtubules, or the skeleton of the parasites, here in purple. And you can see in these normal parasites that the microtubules are really well organized. You have this beautiful arrays. However, if I remove GAPM1A, immediately the microtubules fall apart. Instead of these beautiful um, uh, arrays that we can see here, they completely disassociate. And this has devastating consequences for the cells. So here, here we have three nice normal cells. This is the nucleus here. However, if we lose GAPM1A, suddenly they become monsters. This is a single blob with six nuclei. This parasite will never escape. It will never go on to invade new cells. And so this shows to us how important it is to maintain your structure, even while the world around you is changing. So I would like to thank um, the whole Laredo Lab, my boss, Sebastian, as well as Eliza from the Swanson Biotechnology Center, and my funders, the NIH, the Whitehead, and the Wellcome Trust. Thank you very much. So actually, some of the other images that Claire take, has taken are appear on the MIT Biology's brand new website. So um, if you're interested in seeing more, I would urge you to check out that website, because they put a lot into it, and it looks great. Um, anyway, but you can really kind of see why images like these get people parasited about cell biology. <laughs> and clearly, there is a whole host of things to learn about these images. But we've just learned how important structure is, so I'm going to stay on topic, and I'm going to go on to the next image, which happens to be another image about cells going where we don't want them to go. All right. So our next presenter is actually a two-time award winner. This is his second year winning. And when he won three years ago, it was for a proof of concept image trying to image metastasizing cell, cancer cells uh, in real time. And he promised me at the time that he would be back in a subsequent year with even more sophisticated data. So to coin a phrase, the tumor cells had landed. And here we are at heads or tails. Thanks, Erica. Hopefully I, will, hopefully I will live up to those high expectations that you've set for everybody. So yeah, uh, my name's David Benjamin, and I'm a grad student in Richard Hines' lab. And so our lab's generally interested um, in metastasis, which is the cause of the overwhelming majority of cancer mortality, yet there's really very few treatments in the clinic right now designed to uh, disrupt this process. And that's because it's a very complex process that, re that we really don't fully understand. <laughs> And why we don't fully understand it is because um, it's very dynamic. It's taking place over space and time. And so you really need time-lapse microscopy in order to um, understand metastasis. And that's really tough to do in mice, which is a very common model system uh, for studying metastasis. And it's, really it's, it's difficult to image in mice because, one, uh, metastasizing cancer cells are very rare. Um, and metastasis also generally occurs deep with inside vital organs, which are hard to access with the microscope. So I've actually been using uh, zebrafish embryos as a model in which to study metastasis. 
And that's because they're transparent and develop outside the mother. So they're really easy to image. And by two days old, they have a fully functional closed circulatory system, which you can see from this movie. And so you can inject cancer cells into circulation, and you can follow them in real time in a living animal. Okay, so what are we looking at here? So this image is a uh, six-day-old embryo with red fluorescent blood vessels that was injected four days ago with green fluorescent cancer cells. And the blue here is an agarose mold that's just holding the embryo still during imaging. And so what I'm doing in my project uh, is I'm studying a gene that's called YAP. And YAP is activated in almost all human cancers. And it's also been shown to promote metastasis, but we don't know how it's promoting metastasis. So my project is to try to figure out how this gene YAP is promoting metastasis. And so what I was doing in these experiments is I injected these green cancer cells into the embryo, and then I either injected control cells or cells overexpressing this gene YAP. And then four days post-injection, I came back and I looked, and I saw that um, embryos that were injected with the YAP overexpressing cells had more cells in the brain compared to the control cells. And I've been trying to figure out how YAP is actually uh, promoting brain metastasis, uh, so promoting these cells uh, to go to the brain. And as I said, fish are really great for, for imaging, so I'll show you some movies. So you can actually follow individual cancer cells over time um, in a living animal. And so these movies were taken over the course of 12 hours. So each frame you're going to see is going to be two minutes. It's going to go, it'll go by very quickly. I'm not going to make you watch a 12-hour movie. And so we're looking at the, the tails of these embryos. And so following injection, tumor cells arrest in these really tiny vessels in the tail. And so what, what you'll see on the left are control cells. And so during this 12-hour movie, they're, they're going to be stuck in these tail vessels, and they're not really going to do a lot. So right, you see there's really quite a few cells that have, that have just kind of stayed there for the course of the 12-hour movie. But in the YAP cells, you'll see that they actually manage to move through these small vessels and get back into circulation, and they'll go on to actually form brain metastases. And so now uh, I'd just like to thank everybody who was involved in the project. Because, you know, as, as with all science projects, there are many, many people, and I actually don't have time to thank everybody, so I'm just going to put their names up. Uh, and thank you all for listening. Yep, I think you got some good data. <laughs> all right, and I was even able to make heads or tails of it. So I think this is some genuinely exciting progress. Um, because the more we know about metastasis, after all, the better we can get at preventing it. And as David mentioned, there aren't a lot of treatments that can disrupt the process. But I'm happy to tell you that our next image shines a light on one approach that Koch Institute researchers are taking to fight back against. Um, this is Into the Fold, um, and it's actually two presentations in one. We're going to start with Katarina, who's going to tell you about the project itself, and then Lena will take over to tell you about how the image was created. Um, it's a lot of ground to cover, but honestly, if there's any team who can compress both those stories into a three-minute presentation, it's probably the people using origami to treat cancer. Thanks, Erica. Is this good? Awesome. So good evening, everyone. I'm Katarina, and this is Lena. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the uh, disease behind this image. So what our project is trying to do is we're trying to help ovarian cancer patients who suffer from what is known as peritoneal metastasis, which is shown in this diagram. And what it basically means is that the patient has now um, cancer spread all over their abdomen, their belly, on multiple organs, shown here in yellow, as well as um, their belly being filled oftentimes with fluid containing cancer cells, which is a very big problem. More than 80% of ovarian cancer patients will have this when they present. Right now, their option for treatment starts with surgery. So everything is taken out, as much of the tumor as possible, and also parts of their organs uh, that they can survive um, without. And after that, they can get chemotherapy. 
And what that means right now is they might get um, a tube known as a catheter put directly in their belly um, and held there for multiple weeks. And then once every few weeks, they go to the hospital and they get a multi-liter infusion of a very high dose chemotherapy solution. So we're talking about two liters going straight inside their abdomen. Think of a large bottle of Coke every few weeks. Um, and this is at the highest dose of chemotherapy that they can go through and survive this treatment. Um, right now, this works really poorly. More than half of the patients that uh, are getting this cannot survive all cycles, and they drop out. The main reasons for dropping out are problems with their catheter, as well as infections associated with this, and just the pain and toxicity um, from this high dose and the way of giving the chemotherapy. So our project wants to deal with this problem and stop using this technology for uh, what we call intraperitoneal or IP chemotherapy and come up with a better way to do it. And the idea here is why can't we substitute these multiple infusions through a catheter with just an implant, um, a device that goes inside the belly and delivers chemotherapy uh, at a low dose over multiple weeks. And the ideal design for that would actually be something that gets drug in as many uh, parts of the belly as possible to cover all of those tiny cancers left behind after surgery. So the best design could really be some sort of thin sheet. But the big question now is, OK, how do we put such a big sheet inside the belly without opening the person up to fit it or without you know, having a very invasive surgery? And that's where origami comes into play. So origami, if you were not a child folding up cranes when you were little um, or playing these days with origami paper, really um, can be encountered in, in many parts of life. It's, a, it's an art of folding paper, and you may find it in maps, or you find it in satellites, or in stents. And so it's a way to make something big smaller or give it three-dimensional shape. So what I tried to do was I tried to apply principles of origami to these thin sheets that we create in the lab of material so that we can fit them through tiny tools uh, through a process called laparoscopy, sub-centimeter, a few millimeters in diameter, and then once they go inside the body, open them up in a bigger size. Now the challenge here was that when I came up with this idea and started making what we call proof of concept prototypes, it was actually hard to communicate this visually to, to somebody who doesn't know about the project. It's easy to describe, but when you show a photo of it, these implants don't photograph very well. So I teamed up with Lena, who, aside from being an awesome scientist and PhD student, is also an amazing photographer. And I asked her to help me really capture the three-dimensional spatial quality of these, of these prototypes. And she's going to explain to you how she did it. Great. So I was really excited when Katerina asked me to help photograph her project. Uh, one of the challenges, as she mentioned, um, of photographing these implants is that they're white or transparent. So they don't necessarily come out well in photographs. So to get around this, we played around with two key elements when we were photographing these implants, lighting and color. So as you can see in these images, we manipulated the variety of implant prototypes that she had in various ways. We shone light through them. We used shadows. Um, we shone lights to create shadows in interesting places. And then we used actual origami paper in the background to give these implants their color. And using this relatively simple material as a setup, we were able to get what I think are really beautiful images of the important research that Katerina is doing. So here are some photos that didn't make it outside um, that <laughs> we also took. And they showcase the kind of variety of different form factors and shapes of implants that Katerina has made. And with that, I'd like to thank um, our PI, Michael, who's here today, as well as uh, Dr. Marcella Del Carmen, a surgeon at Mass General that has really helped guide what this device may look like for humans and our funding sources. Thank you. So thank you so much. Uh, it's really stunning. I think this movie could probably go on pay-per-view. Um, actually, but speaking of videos, if you're interested in learning more about this work, um, STAT put out a video last month that really gets into the, um, the how and why behind this project. And you should check it out because it's pretty hardcore origami. All right.
So this presentation, I'm sorry, I've got a cough drop in my mouth. Um, this presentation marks a bit of a transition point in the evening because one of the things that you're going to see more in some of these later presentations is highlighting of the role that visualization and representation of data plays in helping us understand our research and in communicating it. So um, first up is Abel Cortinas, who's going to talk to us about what has become the signature uh, image from this evening. This was one of the first images chosen um, by the judges, and it was an obvious choice for the program because, as Abel will show you, it really combines imagery and data to present this very, very striking visual. Um, but like many of us here today, it is more than just a pretty face. It, and after this presentation, I think it'll be crystal clear why. Thank you so much. She's on fire tonight with those puns. And so thank you, everybody. My name is Abel Cortinas. And as a graduate student here at MIT and in the Koch Institute, the focus of my work here is to develop smarter therapies for diabetes, uh, more specifically insulin-dependent diabetes. Now, as some of you may know, insulin-dependent diabetes, or diabetics, use insulin, which is a protein therapy, to control their blood sugar levels. And it is the proper management of those blood sugar levels that has very important health implications, such as decreasing your risk of heart disease, um, kidney disease, eye disease, stroke, uh, just to name a few. And for this type of diabetes, the holy grail of disease management is mimicking the pancreas, as highlighted on the left. And so what that means logistically for, a, for an insulin-dependent diabetic is that they are performing the cycle on the right as frequently as every four hours uh, of every day for the rest of their life. And so you can imagine that just by trying to compare those two, you're almost setting yourself up for failure. And so the focus of my work aims at trying to develop a smart insulin that is capable of performing all of those tasks automatically without the need for human input. And I do that by making very specific, very direct chemical changes to the insulin protein, such as at the location highlighted by that red sphere, um, where I equipped insulin with artificial sugar sensors or smart sensors that allow for the development of super insulins that can, oh, so sorry, that can not only detect changes in your blood sugar, but more importantly, be able to respond to those changes. And so at the end of the day, after performing all of that really cool chemistry to the insulin protein, we want to make, ultimately, we want to make something that still functions like insulin. Uh, what we don't want is to spend all of that time, money, and energy in making something that is really cool and really expensive, but ultimately useless. And so as a researcher, there are many techniques that I could use and draw from to be able to assess that, to be able to study the protein function and structure. But the one that I want to highlight today is known as x-ray crystallography. And it is my... Uh, involvement in using that te technique that is responsible for the image that you see in the gallery today. And so like the name implies, X-ray crystallography uh, literally involves shooting protein crystals with X-rays, which is really cool. Um, it's a really cool process. And that process begins by first growing these protein crystals in solution. And when they grow to about the thickness of a human hair, you have to literally fish one of those proteins out to be able to shoot them with an X-ray. And that is an art all into itself. And so when you do that, when you shoot these protein crystals with x-rays, you get these really amazing, um, what are known as diffraction patterns. And now to the untrained eye, this may seem like a random assortment of spots, or, or maybe like an old dartboard if you like tilt your head uh, the right way. But to a crystallographer, there is, an immense, um, there is immense order to this chaos. There's a wealth of information that you can draw from these diffraction patterns regarding your protein uh, crystal, uh, or sorry, protein structure. And so with the amazing help of Dr. Victor Cruz and Dr. Robert Grant, who I'm glad to say is, is in, the, in the audience today, present today, we were able to extract that wealth of information in, in regard to the electron density and to the, ultimately, the structural information of those superinsulins, um, as demonstrated here visually. And so ultimately what these experiments and many, many other experiments in, in corroboration told us is that the changes that we are making to these insulin proteins do not harm or or damage the, the protein structure and function in a bad way, which is very important and very significant because what that means is that we can continue to make these kinds of changes to the insulin protein in an effort to better design uh, 
and <laughs> to better design and create smart insulins uh, that will hopefully one day help insulin-dependent diabetics better manage the disease. And so with that, I want to thank you all for your time and attention and the amazing people uh, that I worked with to make this project a reality. Um, the Anderson Laboratory, Dr. Kevin Daniel, Dr. Victor Cruz, Dr. Robert Grant. Um, the uh, amazing core and resources, oh, it's so weird, I don't know why it's, it keeps doing that, um, that helped make this project a reality. And so thank you all very much for your time and attention. So. Sorry, the computer was being so insolent. <laughs> All right. So, um, so as you can see, this is a project that involves overlapping several. Di somebody just got the insulin joke, didn't they? Okay. Um, that it's it is incredibly powerful when you can take multiple data sets and multiple ways of understanding something and put them together, um, and that is really exactly what the next image is all about as well. Um, and that, that process really, I think, makes things greater than the sum of its parts. Um, most of our images in our gallery are meant to be viewed from a distance. And as the person in charge of maintenance in the gallery, I try to get people to move away from the image. Um, but the next image is actually something that gets um, even more impressive when you get up close to it. Um, and so once, and then once you realize that the cells in this image um, are colon cancer cells, it just kind of hits you right in the gut, you know? Um, okay, sorry, clearly folks are running out of intestinal fortitude for my puns. So um, Leah, why don't you come up and make this more digestible for everyone? Hey, y'all. My name is Leah Kaplan, and I'm a research associate, too, in Aviv Regev's lab at the Broad Institute. Um, and uh, in case you didn't pick up on it, I'm not from around these parts. <laughs> I moved to Boston from Nashville, Tennessee, two years ago. And even though I've had to learn how to speed walk to keep up with you New Englanders, you guys are really fast, um, I've been having a wicked good time ever since. <laughs> I guess you could say that my new location has affected my behavior a bit. How these two geographically distant environments impacted my behavior is similar to how some cells behave differently in different parts of a tumor. A, a cell's microenvironment, which includes surrounding cells and chemical and physical signals, can influence how that cell behaves. We want to decipher uh, how the tumor microenvironment impacts these cells um, and how individual cells contribute to cancer progression. Now, to interpret a cell's behavior, we are looking at which genes are being expressed by using single-cell RNA sequencing. Unfortunately, in many single-cell sequencing techniques, the tissue must be ground up in order to isolate individual cells, thus losing that cell's spatial context within the, within the tissue. Uh, now, to reconstruct this, uh, uh, to reconstruct the, the spatial context that's lost in this process, we are coupling single-cell RNA sequencing with different spatial measurement techniques to visualize these cells within their original context in the tumor. Now, other researchers have done this in normal tissues, but tumor tissues, seen on the right, uh, are hallmarked by their loss of organized structures and therefore require a more complex approach. There are, however, certain visible histological features that pathologists use to identify type and grade of a tumor, and we plan to leverage these same features in our own analyses. Now, to acquire and analyze the big picture, literally, we are coupling machine learning with single-cell RNA sequencing and different spatial measurement techniques capable of tagging tens to hundreds of different cellular markers. With this approach, we hope to gain a more comprehensive understanding of the tumor microenvironment and how that leads to cancer progression by looking at the relationship between a cell's location and its behavior. So how do all these concepts relate to our image? Here we are looking at a slice of fluorescently stained colon tumor that was taken from a mouse. The blue is labeling the DNA inside of the cells, and the green is outlining the many, many, many epithelial cells, uh, if you see, if you go look outside. Um, of this tumor section. The yellow is tagging LGR5, which is a stem cell marker of the gut, and the red is tagging MKI67, a proliferation marker. Now what's interesting here is not only do we see overlap 
of these red and yellow probes suggesting that these colon cancer stem cells are proliferating, but that this overlap is present in only part of the tumor section and not evenly distributed throughout. An observation like this leads us to ask, what is different about the microenvironment of this proliferative region that is causing these cells to, to proliferate? Are there certain signals that it's receiving that are saying, yes, go ahead and, and, and proliferate? In these non-proliferative regions, are there certain signals that are inhibiting this, uh, this growth? So this is just one example of the types of questions that we want to, to ask and, and research to, to understand uh, how a cell's location can impact its behavior, and consequently how then, by studying this tumor microenvironment, we can understand how these cells contribute to cancer progression. And so to drive this point home just a little further uh, with some examples from my own life, here are some examples of how location can affect behavior, or uh, more specifically, my eating behavior since moving to Boston. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I have many people to thank. Uh, this is a very collaborative project with uh, people from many different expertise coming together. I'd like to thank Aviv Regev and Arit Rosen Rosenblatt and uh, Omar Yilmaz, and specifically for this image, Inbal Avram Davidi and Jetan Roper. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to the Hope Abet Tang Histology Facility. Everyone there has been so gracious and helpful uh, when I get locked out after 6 p.m. and still need to get my samples. Um, so thank you guys. Uh, thank you to the entire Gev Lab for their help and support. Um, and thank you all for listening. So thank you, Leah, for helping uh, to place this image in the context of the larger research goals and helping people tend to see what you're trying to accomplish. I think you have really amassed a good amount of data here. So. Um, our, the final image of our evening, uh, ironically entitled First Impressions, even though it's the image we're going to be leaving you with, uh, is actually another story about cell behavior and location. Um, the structures that you're going to be looking at are completely unique. They're only found in one part of the brain. Um, and I will tell you that exactly one month ago, this research was featured on MIT News. So if you're interested, you should definitely check that out and learn more. But today, Rodrigo and Eddie are going to come up uh, and give us an overview of the research and an in-depth view of the image itself. Um, I should warn you that we went through several slide decks before we got the movies to play. Um, and everything played perfectly when we tested it. So bear with us um, if we run into technical difficulties. But um, why don't you guys come on up? Good evening, everybody. My name is Rodrigo Garcia, and I am a postdoc in the lab of Yingxi Lin. Uh, my name is Eddie Wen. I'm a research scientist in Yingxi Lin Lab of McGovern Institute here at MIT. Um, this image is selected by the judge to represent a junction between cells in the brain that mark the structure where memories first get encoded. At the Lin Lab, we study how memories are formed and stored in the brain. Uh, we uh, focus on the cellular and molecular mechanism that contribute to these functions. Uh, in particular, uh, we study a activity regulated gene called MPAS4. Uh, and as it turns out, it has quite a bit to say about this uh, structure in the image. One of the greatest mystery is how our brain is, are capable of processing our experience and converting them to memory that can be later recalled. Episodic memory is a form of memory based on our personal experiences, such as memory of neighborhood street where we, you learn how to ride a bike, uh, the beautiful lakeside where you camp with your family, or the cherry blossom tree underneath uh, where you had your first kiss. <laughs> All these memories start right here. Uh, this image showcases the structure where memories are encoded, and to us, uh, it's a little, ti uh, little tiny uh, cherry blossom tree in the brain. Um, wh what you are seeing uh, in green is part of the neuron um, uh, which, uh, that receives the signal uh, from other neurons. Uh, it's called the dendrite. Uh, the colorful tiny structures sticking out of the dendrite are synapses. 
uh, the exact location um, where um, the connections are made. Um, our members are first processing a brain structure called hippocampus. And if we take a closer look uh, in the hippocampus, uh, you'll find uh, different uh, subregions. The connection between these subregions are important for different aspects of the memory processing. Um, because we are interested in the mem uh, formation of the new memory, uh, so we label uh, the cell involved in encoding memories in green and red and look at their connections. So one important and recent technological breakthrough allowed us to expand the brains of the mice that we were using to over four times the original size, increasing our ability to resolve the tiny synapses where these cells communicate. This video is of the cells in the CA3 region, labeled in red, uh, which are receiving the memory information. We could now focus on individual synapses, the contact point between the green and red, and ask how they are changed by experience. Here's another video of the same structures that I was just mentioning. Additionally, the speckles of cyan and magenta are proteins found at the synapses. By labeling different cellular structures and synaptic proteins, we can visualize some of the molecular components that can change the structure and function of these cells. So what you're seeing in our image are the unique synapses on the dendrites of these cells and some of the proteins that are modified by NPAS4. By making 3D reconstructions, we were able to show how these connections are modified by experience. So with that, uh, we would like to thank uh, Ying Shi Lin, who is in the audience today, for her amazing support and mentorship, the members of the Lin Lab, our collaborator collaborators, especially Taeyang uh, Ku, who's a postdoc in the Chung Lab, who was instrumental in uh, the processing of the tissue and some of the in the creation of some of these images. Um, we would definitely also like to thank the organizers, the judges, for selecting our image. Um, and of course, Erica, uh, who we can all agree is fundamental in the success of this <laughs> evening. And thank you. I'm not even going to try to top that. All right. I actually, well, okay, I lied. I actually do want to make a few connections um, before we say goodbye. So um, before we say farewell, I just want to say thank you again to sponsors, judges, and friends, and everybody um, who helped make this event possible. So thank you all again. Um, I hope you will join us on May 3rd for our next uh, Solutions with Insight event. There's information about it on the back of your program. Um, and I hope that you will keep the conversation going with our hashtag KI images. Uh, continue to support scientific research. I'll wish you again a happy International Women's Day. And now I'm going to close things out um, by reminding you of uh, the things we're due, uh, the things we've, been, we've visited tonight. So um, on behalf of the entire team, we are so happy to have made these memories with you. Um, I want to call on Colin, all of you, to continue the conversations and find ways to inject both science and art in your everyday life. Um, I hope you will always seek to learn Miura about the things that inspire you. Yeah, it was the Miura fold <laughs> uh, from the origami. Um, and to that end, please do be sure to circulate around the galleries for the rest of the event. Um, find the people that you want to know more from and, and just be sure to talk about what you've uh, learned tonight. Um, as I said, if you're on social media, please use the hashtag KI images to give, uh, give this exhibit a boost. And um, we, yes, and we absolutely rely on your support and your advocacy for science to sustain the very important work that we do. So we hope that tonight has been time well spent, and thank you so much for celebrating with us.